What's the big deal about Jesus anyway? Is he truly the one Christians claim he is? Does he honestly have an impact on our lives today? See, we live in a world with global influencers around every corner. From TikTok stars to political leaders, their imprint is worldwide. Because of that influence and society's many advancements, it's become very easy for us to ask, does Jesus even matter anymore? Many people think Jesus seems, well, just a bit outdated. The truth is, there's never been another person like Jesus. While he is undeniably controversial, being both hated and loved, no one is more important to our existence. See, throughout history, people have sought to fill in the blank to describe or categorize the impact of Jesus. However, of all the leaders, movements, and religions in the world, Jesus has had and continues to hold the supreme position. Without a doubt, he is the one. Hi, Rock Church. Good to be with you. Uh, my name's Caleb. Uh, yeah, so this weekend, legend has it, um, there was a pretty cool guy that started a church in Utah in 1999, and he, every week, would drum and then preach. And so I'm just trying to be as cool as, as our pastor, Bill Young. So, yeah, finally get a uh, chance to do that. So, yeah, welcome to Rock Church. Like the video said, and like Brian said, we're starting a new series. Uh, we're in calling this The One. We're asking the question, what's the big deal about Jesus? Does he have an impact on our lives today? As the video said, our world is uh, full of influencers all over the place, social media, in sports, entertainment, politics, religious spheres. People are shaping what we believe and what we understand and what we're passionate about, what we dream about, what we care about, and thereby what we do, right? It, be it begs the question, does Jesus still make a difference today? Does he make a difference for the future our prayer throughout this next six weeks is that we will see as a church that there has never been another person like Jesus. Of all the leaders, movements, and religions, Jesus is supreme. A, uh, Yaroslav Pelikan, I think I'm saying his name right, he, he wrote a book called Jesus Through the Centuries. He said this, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible, let me switch that, if it were possible with some sort of super magnet to pull out of that history, every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? It is from his birth that most of the human race dates its calendars. It is by his name that millions curse and, his, and by his name that millions pray. I think that's a pretty good quote. It's a pretty, sums it up pretty well. So in this series, we hope to present the difference that Jesus has made and continues to make and will continue to make in the future for us to understand that we can't live without him because he is the one. Amen? Amen. We're going to be taking some time over the next six weeks to look at six different topics, different areas that Jesus has made a difference in. Some of these topics are interconnected and some of them build off of each other. These are the six, to six topics we'll look at. The uh, first one tonight, we're going to look at culturally the difference Jesus has made in culture. What influence has he made on culture? Really, since the beginning of creation, we're going to look at that difference. We'll see that today. Spiritually, how does Jesus bring us hope in our relationship with God? Hope for this life and hope for eternity. How does that compare to other spiritual and religious leaders? Historically, we will take a look at the incredible impact that Jesus has had and that his followers have had on history in our world. Psychologically, what difference does Jesus make in our minds and in our hearts and in our, uh, as individuals? How has Jesus shown that he cares about us being a whole person, a whole man or woman? Psychologically, or sorry, not psychologically, I said that. Sociologically, we will look at the impact that Jesus has made on society and human relationships, the difference that Jesus makes by being fully God and fully man. And what does that mean for us? And then finally, we'll look at, at the difference Jesus makes inevitably. We will look at how Jesus has changed the future. He has changed the outlook for mankind of the future. Every person will inevitably come face to face with Jesus, and how does that reality change everything for us today? 
But like I said, for today, we're going to look at the impact Jesus has had on culture. We're going to see that he is the influential one. Tonight, we might make a, take a little different look at culture than you might be expecting. Uh, I felt like this topic, when I was thinking about it and praying and preparing, I felt like this topic really runs through and around many, if not all, of the topics we're going to look at in this series. So my hope tonight is really to just set a foundation for the other talks, to be able to hopefully tee up my co-pastors well for the specific examples that the Lord will bring through them. So with all that, let's talk about culture. Culture is an interesting thing, right? For much of history, culture has gone hand in hand with society and geographical uh, location. Culture and society were synonymous for so long. Throughout history, if you pulled up a map and said, this is the city I live, most people could look and understand uh, your culture pretty close to a T, right? Your spot on the map would have said a lot about how you were raised and how, uh, what religious system you were exposed to or raised in. It would have most likely informed the clothes that you wore, what you ate, what you thought about the origin of the world. Most likely throughout history, society and those structures would have shielded people in their culture from too much outside influence. You were a product, really, of where you lived. And of course, this is true for us today, right? In a lot of ways, we're products of our geography, but we're not entirely always products of that. But we're definitely shaped by our household and our neighborhood and our city that we lived in, right? Each, each of those is a little different. Each house, each family is a little different. There's a different culture. For me, this is my family that I grew up in. My parents were products of their household as well. They both grew up in Rhode Island. East Coast, so that very different than Utah. My mother grew up in a larger family and Catholic uh, family, Catholic home. My dad grew up with two brothers and they lived in a strict Baptist household, very strict, like so much so that you didn't even say the word dancing. It was just like a sin because you know where, where dancing leads to. You just couldn't do it. Those two family cultures melded really to make our family, me and my brothers, we grew up in this. We grew up in a Southern Baptist church. I went to a private Christian school my whole life. And interestingly enough, while I lived in Utah that whole time, a predominantly LDS state, I didn't really have any LDS friends. I really didn't have much interaction with LDS folks other than a couple times with my neighbors. And almost every single person that I knew and I hung around with was from my Christian church in this Christian school. So that was my religious culture. And our family, like all families, has its isms, right? It's got its quirks and different things. For whatever reason, one of the isms of our family is we had this culture of ironing, right? Ironing clothes, everything. Honestly, ironing was a big deal in my home. Uh, we ironed just about everything. Your shirt, sometimes your undershirt. Uh, your jeans, like we, everything had to be wrinkle free. I don't know if it was because my dad was in the military or their parents were in the military, but I'm surprised honestly that we didn't iron our socks and underwear because we ironed everything, honestly. To this day, when I leave the house with a wrinkle in my shirt, I fear seeing my parents because I know they will notice that I have a wrinkle in my shirt. It happened this week, honestly. Uh, so yes, we are a product of our culture in our home, right? And the environment that we grew up in. But in many other ways, the world is no longer just that. We are no longer just products of where we live. As technology and advancements have gone throughout time, that has changed, right? The first advancement probably was the highway system that you could go from city to city much easier one, uh, in those days. And then, of course, ship routes and, and sea travel made it much easier for there to be a crossing of, of culture. And then, of course, larger advancements came along, like the printing press, and then, of course, the telegram that made communication and news spread a lot faster, uh, much, much quicker. And then, of course, telephones and television just made things almost instant. Uh, and then finally came that we, right now, the internet, right, with personal computers and smartphones. The world, in many ways, has grown smaller for societies and cultures to be able to uh, for them to be able to meld together. It, 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 honestly, it crosses borders. And more than ever now, it's true with smartphones and cellular internet that everyone is connected, just about everybody, with social media, global entertainment. We are seeing this culture that is reaching across borders, regions, ethnic groups, and languages. 
We now have an online culture that seeps into our lived out culture, right? That's almost this global culture influencing our worldviews on politics and business and finance and relationships and marriage and sexuality and gender and the list goes on and on, right? Places that were once more incubated in their views and their, their opinions are now opened to the world's ideas and practices. Kids are are exposed to ideologies and views at a much earlier age. We could almost say that we have a global culture, right? Or we're growing towards that. It's one that crosses societies and borders. So the truth is culture crosses over all these topics that we're gonna study in these coming weeks. Religion and spirituality are influenced by culture, right? And history tells the story of that culture. Psych psychology is morphing in light of this global culture, and society is being changed as culture changes. And, it, and in turn, it informs the future, right? So many, in many ways, this is just a stepping off point for the other topics we'll look at. So I want to present to you in this, again, in this part one of our series that since the beginning of time, Jesus has always been the influential one. He is the influencer of culture, the creator and shaper of culture. And in the end, I hope we understand that he has and will continue to use us, mankind, for his kingdom purposes in culture. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for a chance to worship you and to be together and to, to come before you, God. We just we love you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you uh, just for a chance to study about you. I pray you'd speak to us now. We need you. We need your words. We need you to enlighten uh, who you are to us, Lord. We love you. We commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you were to uh, Google the most influential person in history, uh, Jesus usually comes up about one in the top three, right, with some other religious leaders of the day. I saw one website that has like a, uh, people are allowed to vote, and, uh, for, and in that website, Martin Luther King Jr. was the most influential person in history. It's interesting. Uh, who our society sees as the most influential. Of course, Time Magazine every year puts out their uh, 100 most influential people. Each year, uh, whether it's political leaders, pop stars, athletes, scientists, activists, social media stars. And sometimes it's easy to look at these magazines and to roll our eyes, and sometimes it's Oh, yeah, that's a, a natural pick. But sometimes the influence they bring can feel superficial, right? Or just like a, a flash in the pan, a short time. But nonetheless, it's influence. We, we are influenced all over the place. Most of these people and celebrities and influencers, they are trying to bring change into this world. It matters to them how the world looks, and they want to bring change. And so it begs the question for Jesus, for us to ask, right, does culture matter to him? Does culture matter to God? I would say yes. Does shaping influence and, and changing and caring for culture, is that a priority of his? I hope this weekend I want, us, I want to take us on a journey of what I believe is a biblical view of culture from the beginning and Jesus' role in it. So your first point on your handout, if you're following along, is that Jesus is the creator of culture. We need to understand this, I think. He's the creator of culture because he is the creator of all, right? It's important to start with the truth that Jesus cares about culture because he created everything. If we don't get that, then we won't understand why God cares in this area, John 1 says this, Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus was there at the beginning. He made all things, so he cares about the world that we live in. He cares about the state of the world now and how, what it's always been. Jesus has always been about cultivating life and cultivating culture. This is important for us to get. The word cultivate Interestingly enough, the word cultivate comes from the same origin as the word culture. It means to direct special attention, to foster, to impart culture, to uh, civilize and refine and care for something. So that's what Jesus did in creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was there, the triune God. 
in the beginning, he did that, right? It's just like this new shirt. I don't know if you knew we have this new shirt. Pastor Tony, I'm going to just uh, hype him up. He designed this awesome shirt. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I know what you might be thinking. I made sure to ask if it's a young earth t-shirt, and it is. So uh, no worries there. Pastor Tony hooked us up. If you don't get that joke, that's fine. You can ask me later. Uh, but Jesus did this. He made all things. We need to know that Jesus in creation in six days was cultivating life. He was culturing. He was bringing about culture. Think about that. A, a void, formless universe. Jesus, the triune God, comes Father, Son, and Spirit. They come and they cultivate life and plants and stars and animals. They are making this thriving energy environment. God is making this thriving environment for life and harmony to happen, for life and culture to flourish. He's doing that. God is doing that. A place that he can create man and women in his own image, and they will, uh, the man and the woman will have relationship, right? And they will bring glory to God in that relationship. And then Jesus, at the beginning, commissioned Adam to work with him. It's important for us to understand, since the beginning of creation, that has been a role of ours as mankind. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. This was God's heart and plan all along. It's wild to think about, honestly. He invited Adam and Eve and mankind, us, his image bearers, to cultivate and culture the earth alongside of him. We get to do that. We get to partner with him in that. He told Adam to name animals and to take care of the garden and enjoy life. He always, says, or he always says to them to fill the earth, um, to be fruitful and multiply, to cultivate along with his wife, to make babies, right? To raise children, to make a family culture, to make a, a culture with a community. Jesus invited man to bring God's dominion over creation. That's awesome. To partner with God and be his representatives for good. We need to understand that is our purpose, church. If you don't know that's your purpose, that is why God has created us. But of course, we know that didn't go as planned for too long, right? Because God gives us a choice. He gave Adam and Eve a choice. He wasn't going to force them to obey. Would they choose to walk in God's good plan and walk, work alongside him, or would they choose to reject it and make their own culture in their own way? Sadly, they fell into the deception of the enemy, Right? The devil who wanted to rule over a counterfeit culture, which is our second point, that Satan deceives with a counterfeit culture. Genesis 3 said, The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say? This is the question that has guided the world's counterfeit culture since the fall. It just is. It's, it's Satan's favorite phrase. Did God really say? Did God really say? Obviously, Satan deceived and, and made a mess of it, but we played a part in it. Adam and Eve played a part in it, right? We haven't helped along the way, listening to lies. God gave Adam and Eve a choice, and he, he has given every man, woman, and child a choice since. But we know Satan's tactics are the same, right? It's his favorite question throughout time, is to just to take God's word and just to twist it a little bit, make us doubt it just a little bit. How, does he did, how did he do that with Adam and Eve? Did God really say not to eat the fruit of the tree, right? Did God really say you will die? Did God really say that you should worship him only and you should obey him? We hear it today, right? Did Jesus really say that he is the only way to heaven? Did Jesus really say he's going to return and judge the world? Did Jesus really say that you, of all people, can be forgiven? You? Did God really say did God really say what we should do with our bodies when it comes to our sexual expression? Did God really only make two genders? We could go on and on. Did Jesus really say we should put others first and serve them and die to ourselves and love them and put them more important than us? But of course, how quickly Adam and Eve fell, fell for that lie. And so did their descendants, and so do we, right? You can go down the line of stories in Genesis where people... Time and time again, just walking out this lie, this deception, believing it, just taking it in and walking with it, the counterfeit culture apart from God's good plan for us. 
So, of course, as we continue on in the Genesis journey, in the Bible's journey, it's the story, God floods the earth, right? He judges it. He's like, I'm going to start over. I'm going to only save eight people, and I'm going to give them the purpose again. I'm going to tell them to do it. They're going to go be fruitful and multiply, multiply and fill the earth and live for me. And, of course, that didn't happen, right? In fact, the people, not long after that, came together, actually. Instead of obeying God and doing what he said and going and creating culture, they're like, we're going to stay here and we're going to build this big fortress, this big tower, and we're going to trust in ourselves because they believed a lie. Did God really say? Did he tell us to spread across the world? We're not going to believe it. Again, Satan deceived with this counterfeit culture that was not from God. So we see in the Tower of Babel that God confused them all and gave them all new different languages. He was basically like, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to force it on you. I'm going to make it happen. So all of a sudden, nobody in the Tower of Babel can talk to each other. They don't understand. There's these new languages, and they have nothing but to go and to spread out and to fill the earth and to multiply and to create these cultures. But of course, they don't do it honoring the Lord. But what's amazing is that God never stopped inviting man into the cultivation and work with him. And he has never stopped since then, which is our next point. Point three, since the fall, the Lord has invited mankind to live out his kingdom culture. Once Adam and Eve left the garden and had children, you know, if we're backing up from the Tower of Babel, right after they leave the garden, you know the story of Cain and Abel, their, bo- their kids. God saw the sin that was holding on to Cain. He already saw it. He saw the deception and the, of sin and of the devil pulling him to live according to his own truth and gauge what is right and wrong, to live by his flesh. And God saw that where Cain was headed, yet he still held out his hand and, and offered a solution back. He warned him. He basically says it this way. He says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Of course, you know the story, what happened. We know Cain doesn't listen. He doesn't take the invitation, doesn't take the warning, kills his brother Abel and becomes the first example of murder just diving headlong into the counterfeit culture of sin, right? That, of course, only becomes more prevalent as we've already discussed, and God knows he knew he must do something to fix this. And even back then, right after the fall, he knew what the solution would be. He promised it to Adam and Eve. He knew that people would not accept that invitation. We just wouldn't be able to do it on our own. Even as sin grew and the world gave in to more and more sinful nature, God continually had a plan, and he continually called his kingdom people, those who would surrender to him, to live for him. He didn't give up on us. It's amazing. God could have just been like, nope, we're done. It's incredible. We see this when God invites a man named Abram to be his vessel, to bring about God's blessing on the earth. Abram accepted, but really he couldn't do it on his own. So God promised to bless the world, to influence the world through a coming king who would be one of Abraham's offspring. He said this, through your offspring, all the nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. God had this plan that he promised to Abraham around 2,000 years before Jesus was even born as a baby in Bethlehem. But while he waited, God continued to invite Abraham and his offspring to work with him to influence the world for God's kingdom. This same offer was given to Abraham's descendants, right, on and on until we got to Moses and the Israelites, and we just spent, right, eight months studying the book of Hebrews, looking a lot of, at the laws and the instructions that Moses gave to the Israelites. But God direct, gave direct instructions to his people of what he wanted their culture to look like. God wanted to establish a culture with his chosen people to live by. Standards and practices that would not only influence their lives, but the world around them. It was an invitation by God to his people to live for his kingdom, a culture of submission to God, and to work alongside God to bring good into the world. 
When we read the Old Testament, right, a lot of these laws can just seem confusing, antiquated, dated, right? We don't get them. But truthfully, when we look at what God gave his people at that time, it was a tremendous blessing for their good. If they chose to live by God's way, they would be blessed. It would go well for them. God wanted the Hebrews to stand out from other cultures of the world, to be drastically different from Egypt, where they just left, to be drastically different from the people who live in Canaan, where they are headed. They would be set apart, holy amongst the other nations, and God called them to live differently, to act differently, to speak differently, to treat strangers differently, to treat them with dignity and respect, to welcome others from outside, to honor them, to to welcome them, but to not participate in their sin, in their idol worship, in their sexual depravity or their child sacrifices and murder. That was happening in those cultures, right? You read about it in the Old Testament, to not sacrifice your your children to Molech. That was happening. God didn't want that for his people. God called them to do this really from top to bottom in this culture, from diet and sanitation, to marriage, and sexual practices, to parenting, to the sanctity of life, and even in the treatment of animals, God wanted to influence their culture and direct them, right? You read in the Old Testament, in the law, where it's like, it says, don't boil a young, goat's, uh, a young goat in its mother's milk. Like, what? But that must have been happening. God said, it will not be so with you. My people won't act in this way. God wanted Israel's culture to influence the world for good. He wanted to fulfill this this prayer in Psalm 67. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, right? We sang that tonight. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Every time Israel turned away from that, right? Time and time again, if we read the Old Testament, they didn't follow the rules very much. And it, didn't, it went bad for them, right? But when they would turn back to God, to his ways, to walk in his culture that he was setting up, truly turn back, not just in action, but in their heart and in their affections to honor the Lord, they would experience the blessing that God promised. And also the nations around them would hear of how their good God had blessed them. And they would come and inquire, what has your God done for you? It affected the world around them. For us today, we need to realize that all of this shows that God has something to say about mankind's need for him, spiritually and physically and culturally. We have a role to play with Jesus through this, which is the sub-point here. Jesus invites his people to live counterculturally. This applies to us Jesus said in John 14, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. I want us to think about this idea for a second. Jesus, God of the universe, creator of all things, put, just imagine this, if you, don't, if you don't get this, he, Jesus, is offering you an invitation He wants to work with you and through you. He wants to walk alongside of you. Just let that sink in. Imagine, you could use this, many different athletes for this, but imagine you like golf and you get an invitation from Tiger Woods to play golf, right? He's like, I want to do doubles. We'll we'll make it all happen. You show up. Turns out you're not playing with Tiger Woods. You're playing with this caddy, right? And he's awesome. He's been around Tiger. He's like, Tiger Woods would do this. He wouldn't do that. So you're like, cool, I'll I'll soak it in. I'll try to follow along. But it would not be the same as playing with Tiger Woods, right? He's back at the clubhouse eating a club sandwich. And you're like, this is cool, but it could be cooler, right? All of a sudden, though, imagine this. Tiger Woods finally steps out of the clubhouse, like in his prime, right? Like not now, but like... 20 years ago, you know, he just steps out in his prime and he's like, I'm ready to play. That would be amazing, right? He'd be like, all right, I'm here. I'm going to show you how it's done. Well, let's partner together. You can lean on my performance. You know, I'm going to just hit a drive forever and we'll go up to that ball, right? And then I'll hit another ball and you, you can just like follow along with me, right? And I'll be along with, on the ride for you to cheer you on and to show you what I do. And you can learn from me and lean on me. Well, that's what Jesus 
does for us. He invites us. He is there with us. He's the one we are invited to partner with, to learn from, to lean on. He's the one with the good plan, and we can trust him. That invitation should excite us and get us fired up. That is the purpose for our life. Jesus saw that we couldn't do it alone, and he, he didn't listen because we didn't listen to the prophets, right? The people in the past didn't listen to prophets and warnings, so Jesus said, I will have to come show you how it's done. Jesus said, I will become like you. I will show you how I want mankind to live and influence the world and how I want to cult cultivate that my way. And then after showing you this perfect example, Jesus sent his people out to go do it, right? Jesus broke down cultural and racial barriers. He spoke to a Samaritan woman at the well. He spoke directly to the self-righteous, counterfeit, legalistic, religious leaders, right? He showed love to the outcast. He healed the sick, and he ate dinner with the sinner who was rejected. And then he said to his followers, go and do the same. Go and do the same. Do as you have seen me do. Go spread my kingdom to the whole world, to all of the nations, to the whole world. He wants the nations to worship him, he, and he wants to work through us. But our, our final... Point, point four is Jesus desires to redeem and reconcile culture for his glory. He wants to work through us. Matthew 28, you know the Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all nations. That's for us. Go and do it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to redeem the culture. To redeem means to save and to take possession of. He is king, and he wants culture to come under his lordship. He wants to reconcile. To reconcile means to bring something back to what it was supposed to be, right? What he intended in the garden, in creation, he wants to bring it back to that. Jesus wants to take the culture and the world and cultivate it under his authority. He wants to mold it and have it grow under his watch, of course, we know Jesus left his Holy Spirit with us, his people, his bride, his church. He has made these little pockets of kingdom culture, right? We call it the local church. That's the job of the local church. That's the point here, gatherings of Christians that would strive to live like Jesus and work like Jesus and speak like Jesus. That is what we're seeking to do here in Utah, to be a countercultural church in Draper, Utah to honor Jesus as Lord, to work to be a welcoming and inviting place where Jesus can reveal himself to people as they are welcomed, as they're embraced, as they're loved and welcome, welcomed as they are, to be a place that Jesus can, by his grace, then lovingly and graciously show people their sin and convict them lovingly and graciously so that they would turn away from their sin and they would cling to Jesus and they would be new and they would be changed a place where he can change people from within and give them a new purpose to go and do the same for someone else. And we want to spread this to the whole world, that, right? That's, that's our vision statement for the Rock Church. If you don't know this, you need to know it. It is one life at a time, one world at our life, in our lifetime. We want to reach the world. We want to be a part of local bodies of Christ reaching the world. That's why we have people in Sweden right now, right? sharing the gospel. That's why we blessed the Wish family a couple weeks ago to be missionaries in the Congo. That's why we had a team go to Honduras and we have another team going to Italy. We care about the world because Jesus cares about the world. It's why we partner with other organizations reaching the nations. The word nations in this verse, in, the, in uh, Matthew 28, it is the Greek word ethne. It is a plural noun that speaks of all races and tribes and languages, all people groups. And God wants all cultures to worship him. We need to understand this. Every ethne will bring him praise. It will. It's foretold already. Look at this verse in Revelation. It says, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you, Jesus Worthy are you, for you are for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Sounds like a pretty cool heavenly concert, right? It's probably rowdy. It's gonna be awesome. As we have seen, God has created every ethne, 
the different races and languages, the different cultures. And in the end, God wants to redeem and reconcile for himself a people from all of them. That's his heart, and he will do it. Even now, he invites cultures that are largely untouched by him to entrust themselves to him, not to some westernized church, right? To not some way that the, the other cultures have done, done it, right? No, he desires praise and the beauty and the uniqueness of those specific cultures. When churches are started in other nations and other languages, he is glorified by their culture, their practices that are brought under his authority. He doesn't want all of this, right? He doesn't want a rock church with all the stage and the lights and the sound. All that's great for here. But in another culture, in another language, he wants them to bring what he has given them, what he has cultivated, to bring that under his authority. Yeah, throw out the things that are just outright rebellion, sin, sure, like demon worship or whatever, but bring the beauty of their culture under his authority for him to redeem it and reconcile it under his lordship. That's what we see in history, right? Many of the, the hymns that people love today so much, in the 16th century, those were bar tunes, right? It honestly was. They took Christian truth and they applied it to a melody that they sang at the bar holding a beer. And now it's all reverent. One day that was just the cultural thing and God redeemed it for his glory for us to worship him, amen? amen. That's what heaven is going to be like, different Tribes and tongues singing, bringing their unique expression to worship Jesus. So our final subpoint today is this. Jesus' ways are a countercultural blessing. The disciple Simon Peter saw this blessing firsthand. Lucky him. Honestly, he saw some incredible things, and this is what he had to say when Jesus said, are you done with me? Are you going to leave? He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Throughout the Bible, throughout time as Jesus has influenced culture, the world and the world by revealing himself, we can see time and time again the blessing that God's kingdom brings to people and societies and cities and families he shows his goodness. He invites the world into that goodness. He says this. He promises this. I will give you all of me. I will give you all of, you will experience all of me, all of my goodness. And then you will use that to go bless the world so others will know my goodness. This is the impact and the change that he has brought about. So much good through his people, Christians, as they are called to fill the world with common grace, to bring God's love and justice and care and mercy to those in need, to stand for truth, to do what's right. Before we bring this to a close, I just want to share a few quick examples of this, of, of God working and affecting culture through his people. I'm sure you'll hear more examples in this series, but here's just a few. You might even hear some of these again. That's awesome. Historians tell us, first century historians tell us about this crazy group of people called Christians that would go to where sick people were and they would take care of them. They would expose themselves to disease, people who, that no one else would go and care for them. And they would also, talks about adopting these babies in, in Roman culture, they would, they would just leave babies to die to exposure. And the Christians would say, well, that's a life, that is an image bearer of God and they would take it and adopt it an incredible influence on that culture. Florence Nightingale and others like her, bringing about really modern day healthcare, right? Caring for people that no one else would, putting themselves in harm, again, running into a messy situation that nobody else would. Incredible. John Newton in the bottom left there, he was a slave trader in England and was saved by Jesus. And he was changed forever. And then he wrote the song Amazing Grace and he fought in England to, to end the slave trade. Jesus changed him and he went on to influence culture. George Mueller, many of these are biographies too. You should read some biographies because they're incredible to hear the stories of what God has done through his people. George Mueller, an amazing example, trusting Jesus to adopt and, uh, or, or have an orphanage with just so many kids because Jesus had called him to live for God's kingdom. Incredible stories of faith and, and impacting the culture. 
Bruce Olson is a 19-year-old uh, missionary, and I think in the 70s, he went to South America to an indigenous tribe. They called him Brushko because they couldn't pronounce his name. Uh, but he experienced incredibly brutal things for the sake of the gospel, but he brought the blessing of the gospel in a way that this culture, this unreached culture, could understand so God could redeem their culture. It's an amazing book. You should read it. And then there's another picture that I don't have the time to share that one. Honestly, it's a little longer story, but you could ask me some time. You could, I'll, I'll email you if you want to know the story of that guy. Well, it's not that guy specifically, but a, a man like that in the right corner. So it's just incredible examples. Everyone in God's kingdom has the opportunity to affect culture from the least to the greatest to live quiet, spirit-filled, peaceable lives, cultivating love, it doesn't have to be about tearing down culture and bearing down on people. It doesn't have to be a life of shouting at people and telling them they're going to hell in anger. It's a, life, it's a life-giving call to the world in today's culture to walk in a manner of the king. Walk with the king. We can call people that. It's like fi fish swimming upstream, right, against the current, and other fish swimming down the current. We don't have to scream and yell. We don't have to fight them. If we bump into them, we can say sorry, but they will take notice to what we're doing, right? Some of them might yell and be angry, but they'll notice what God is doing in us as we swim upstream. Our lives with Jesus in us will affect the culture around us, sometimes in small ways, sometimes in large ways. But through the church, the people of Jesus, he has and will continue to influence the world for God's kingdom for his culture. He will use us, and that's incredible. Let's, let's partner with him in that. Let's take up the invitation and, and uh, work alongside of him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for tonight and just the reality of who you are. Jesus, thank you that you're a creator of all, that we can worship you. Thank you that you Invite us to work alongside of you, God. Would you help us to do that? No, help us to know the next step to take, to look to you. God, would you just make that clear for us? We, we want to obey you. We want to follow you. We want to make much of you in this world, Jesus. Would you help us? Would you use us like you've used the people uh, of your kingdom throughout history, God? Would you just make us a, a city on a hill, God? Would you make us salt and light in this world, that we would, that you ultimately through us would affect this culture, this world for your name's sake. God, we love you. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.